Jean-Claude Redonnet is Professor Emeritus and Research Director at, at the Sorbonne, Doctoral School 4. He's a specialist in British and Commonwealth history. His publications and research focus on international relations in the second half of the 20th century. He's had a very interesting career. Along the way, he held several positions in public diplomacy, the, the subject of his talk today, as head of the cultural section of the French embassies in Canberra, uh, in Ottawa, and in Tokyo. He also served under the auspices of Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie as rector of uh, l'Université Léopold Sédar Senghor. Is that reasonable pronunciation? Which is, for those who don't know, it's in Alexandria, Egypt. He was there from 1991 to 1993. Uh, he specialized there in postgraduate studies in African development. And perhaps most importantly, at least to us, he was also director of the Middlebury, of the French School at Middlebury College from 1998 to 2003. His talk today is titled Public Diplomacy and the Challenges of European Power. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jean-Claude Redonnet back to Middlebury College. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Stanger, Alison, thank you very much for your generous introduction. <laughs> I'm indeed very grateful for your invitation to speak uh, here at the Rotten Center, and I'm truly honored to be here today. And I feel really privileged to be given this opportunity to share some thoughts about public diplomacy and what I call European power. On a lighter note, as many others, I suppose, I could have said, Oh, to be in Middlebury again, <laughs> now that April is here, eh? <laughs> well, I hope Robert Browning would have pardoned me for this parody, but because uh, I re really have a particular pleasure to be in here in Middlebury in spring, as you just said, Alison, as faculty and also director of the French School, I was fortunate to spend 13 summers on this wonderful campus but I've never had until today the privilege of enjoying a full day of Green Mountain Spring with a little sprinkle of water, I understand. <laughs> so, public diplomacy and the challenges of European power. Why such a subject for my presentation? There is, for me, a conjunction between um, two areas of studies. Public diplomacy in Europe, of course, they have, as you said, occupied a large place in my professional life, both in academia and uh, diplomacy. But besides, I believe that the resurgence of Europe and European power expressed by its diplomacy today at the turn of the 21st century is, in my view, a subject of growing importance in the field of international relations. It deserves a specific analysis, particularly on both sides of the Atlantic, as it bears on transatlantic relations. So we have here a new situation, which is more and more described, it's true in geopolitical and geoeconomic terms, but which could also be worth defining in theoretical terms. So debating this subject, as we would do today, could hopefully serve actors in the field on both sides of the Atlantic. So now to my, uh, the outline of my presentation, which you have here. I shall briefly deal with five points, starting from, of course, formulating an introductory hypothesis to concluding remarks in the form of a question. And the question is, in what way will the reformulated European diplomacy that I'm trying to describe now briefly, in what way will this influence transatlantic relations? So, first of all, this is a straightforward hypothesis which I've formulated for you in two complementary assertions. One, as you can see, European public diplomacy has been one of the main vectors 
in the promotion of what we call now the European narrative since 1945 and a defining expression of its emerging soft power. Now, but let me say that by narrative of the continent, expression of mind there, I mean the description of the European construction as told by contemporary observers. From the letter rise, Europe for Churchill in Zurich, 1946, from the Schumann Plan, the European communities to the European Union, of course, of 27 member states as it is now, the single market and the single currency and the common currency. It's a narrative which also to me, hence the second part of the hypothesis, ushers into contemporary geopolitical perspectives the hypothesis that Europe is by now promoting itself or has been promoted, could be promoted as a world power again successfully by using the resources of its soft power. Now, this, of course, calls for definitions. Now, the definitions and reference I'm, I base this presentation on are all taken from two complementary set of sources. First of all, uh, <coughs> the one is about soft power, and hence my large quoting of, of Joseph Nye Jr., of course, here. The second is about what Europe is, or stands for, and the role it is playing in a globalized world as viewed by, I would say, some of the leaders and some of the decision makers in the European, on the European stage. At any rate, I put together a page of references which I'll be very happy to give you at the end of this presentation, should you like to have more details about my references. So let me start with, first of Europe, and European power. Well, in, I would say that by conventional standards, Europe was, after the war, a non-power. And you might even say that the expression European power is almost a contradiction in terms. And I think it was. And this largely, of course, in the late 40s and the 50s. However, let me jump here at a very important point. However, power in its national expressions was still there, resurfacing, at least as we have seen, until 1956, which is for Europe the Suez Crisis, or reflecting also post -war, a post-war legacy which is still valid today with for example, mainly Britain and France accessing a nuclear deterrence during that time, and also remaining to the day two of the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, that is, with veto power. It is true that with the 1957 Treaty of Rome, six European nations began to act collectively again. But the question has remained for decade. Would the return of Europe on the world scene as a self-shaping economic and political entity, albeit, of course, limited in traditional power, mainly military, would this return of Europe express a new form of power? Would express a show, the show of a will and the resources to act again as a power. My next assumption <laughs> is that in a sort of organic process for the first time, Europe reinvented or has reinvented its power, but of course as a soft power. Mark Leonard, who is one of the uh, recent critics of, of the subject, has recently suggested, as you can see here, that the lack of hard power in Europe probably led 
So the creation of that form, of a form of European soft power, that's what he called the power of weakness. Now, I personally can see three reasons for this reinvention of, of European power as soft power. One, reinvention of European power derived from what I would call the necessity of restoring a collective credibility of Europe and Europeans as significantly contributing to progress, development in a new world order. Two, this coincided, or has coincided in the long run to the day, with an opportunity. And the opportunity was indeed the end of the Cold War, which has de facto for Europe and all of us ushered ushered in a world order that is, of course, does not signify the end of history as uh, some have suggested, particularly the end of European history, but emphasized, rather, the factors of change that had been frozen during the geopolitical stalemate of the second half of the 20th century, such as the rule of law, to some extent, the end of discriminations and racism, the end of ideologies, and above all, the renunciation of war. Three, it was becoming apparent, at least I believe in the last decade of the 20th century, that the new European geopolitical entity should develop a strategy to, well, to disseminate the good news on the continent, but also to the rest of the world, that Essentially, Europe was back, but it had to be seen as a force for the good in an increasingly globalized world. Talking about public diplomacy as soft power, and particularly soft power resources, <laughs> the <laughs> why should the European strategy based and vehicled on public diplomacy. Well, <laughs> because I believe this public diplomacy composes the essential of what has been defined since then in modern terms, particularly by Joseph Nye, as soft power. And this table that I'm uh, put together by him, by Joseph Nye Jr., uh, with of course comparative purposes in his book about American power, hard and soft, and the rest of the world, speaks volumes about the tradition, first of all, of public diplomacy as soft fire in Europe. It also confirms the conventional view of soft power being fiscally translated into public diplomacy. Of course, the ratio between hard and soft power resources is very interesting to note uh, because it concerns here the US and the rest of the world, but also because in this particular case for me, nailing down the argument that I'm promoting, it shows that, of course, that includes the, the, the top three European defense budget of the day, which is to say that of Britain, that of Europe, and that of Germany. Public diplomacy in Europe as you saw, is, is a fact, but it's also a tradition, a national tradition, I should say. All of us have done that. And post-war national public diplomacies, well, I would say operate under the same constraints, but also with the same objectives, which are described here in two different uh, uh, quotations. The one is taken from the, uh, well, the latest of the UK reports on public diplomacy. It's a Lord Carter, of course, report. And the next one, of course, which is mirroring the uh, 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 observations of the same nature, uh, in general, on public diplomacy by Joseph Nye, where you can see a number of constants. One, public diplomacy is, of course, still government controlled and government oriented. But public diplomacy is primarily used to disseminate 
information which has to be credible because it is truthful and then and then as this takes us back of course to Ed Moreau's Cold War definition of, uh, of, of, of public diplomacy and the principles of that in US public diplomacy but as you see we it's it's not merely public relations first of all it is a lot of information it is a lot of relations but it's not simply public relations and on top of this, which I'm driving to say, well, European and national public diplomacies of the day still work in the same way. They have similar resources. They are all planning on a form of long-term investment with long-term uh, effects. But also, they may have different perspectives. So let me talk first about the general perspectives for the national diplomacies in particular. In fact, if you look carefully at public diplomacies in Europe, the national ones I mean, well, those are cultural diplomacies. National public diplomacies are, are, are based, I would say, on, on the promotion in, in varying degrees, that's sure, of language and culture, of a language and a culture. Look at the British Council language and culture, Britishness these days. Look at the various institutes, the Goethe of the German, the Alliance of the French, the Cervantes, uh, the uh, Dante Alighieri, the Camoish. They are all there with the same principle. But also, and this is typically French as you know, culture even means artistic which is sometimes de de decried. Uh, say, for example, the Association Française d'Exercitique, now Culture France, has for a long time been the central hub, I mean the hub of French public diplomacy. Anyway, all of them, in all public diplomacies, also emphasize the importance of a global outreach to distant audiences. And this is particularly true with their radios and television, the BBC. Deutsches Welle, Radio France, France 24 now, all trying to bring to the world a different point of view, either in their national language or in the target audience language. So seeing in that light, as you can see, once again, the, uh, <clears throat> the investment that you have there is going to be, um, even if it is long term, is going to be a question by the, the real nature of what I call now, if there is some, a European public diplomacy. In that respect, I believe that, of course, European diplomacy should coincide with national uh, practices of diplomacy. But it differs also in, in nature. European diplomacy in that respect cannot be a simple addition of national diplomacies. As, obviously, it now has to promote essentially transnational values. And on top of that, a new identity, a sort of, I coined the word of course, a sort of Europeanness. And the major departure from the exercise of public diplomacy is that for the first time, I think, in the history of diplomacy, correct me if I'm wrong, it has to address internal issues in Europe, particularly to bring the reality of Europe to its citizens. And that's very important because this is a message which has been centrally relayed by some but also nicely subdued or erased in some of the national debates. Think about the debate on sovereignty and even on identity. And in that respect, I think it could be said today that Europe has, or could be in a position to mobilize formidable assets. And these assets here, as you can see, could be, for example, seen as being well, multilingualism is one of the <laughs> seldom uh, hidden aspects, at least of the time, 
of European multilingualism. It doesn't have to deal with languages, but it has to deal with multilingualism. The intercultural dialogue, which is the phrase coined for that purpose by that diplomacy. And of course, all the mobility which has been translated recently in education, in training, in work, in research. Well, these are the real assets which really ground that diplomacy on transnational values, but also actions. They don't exist, of course, with national uh, diplomacies. The, well, those have therefore translated to me, and this is why it looks a little theoretical here, but these are tr already translated into policies. Uh, policies that frame European lives at the moment and are also uh, promoted now outside as the external part of the public diplomacy I'm talking about. And let me quote one very specific example dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, external relations. One, it's the common foreign and security policy of Europe which has not only, of course, helped develop the, what is now known as the European security strategy, but, and this is extremely important today, it has served to, 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 um, to a new form of collaboration with the environment of Europe through its, what is called now, the European neighborhood policy. How do you deal with the Russians? How do you deal with the Mediterranean when you are Europe? This is all the problem. So, let us ask ourselves, what are the real perspectives of European public diplomacy as I'm trying to describe it? I think the answer is that it relies on I should say two prospective assets, prospectives, and a number of also very, very heavy historic liabilities. Of course, the first asset is that it no longer has a need to compensate for the lack of hard power. It's a thing of the past. And by saying that, you will see that in such, it will naturally, uh, as, as, as a force towards the, uh, the outside, it would appear as non-aggressive. Second is that more and more, I believe, the emergence of Europeanness I was talking about as a positive image is the result of successful material achievements particularly, of course, in, in the realm of the economy, and even to some extent in politics, where things and the scene is frayed. The fabric of that is extraordinarily frayed. Nonetheless, it starts happening. And, unfortunately, to the back of all that, there exists an important set of liabilities, whereby, unless, unless, and I should say, until, not to look optimistic, but until national policies converge in Europe, policies and attitudes in general, converge and coincide with the new representations of Europeanness. I mean, this positive image cannot easily take root. And I'm here referring, of course, to some of the major liabilities. First, the resurgence of all evils. Racism, anti-Semitism, which is very much at the root of all that. But also, in the reality of societal development, you see, how do we all treat ethnicity, to start with? How, of course, do we all treat immigration? So, let me start recapping the arguments, which, in my view, best qualify public diplomacy uh, in its role as the main exercise of European soft power. Public diplomacy, <clears throat> first of all, is a tool to show that, or which has shown already, that Europe has a power to attract. 
Well, public diplomacy promotes, once again, Europe as a force of attraction. It has the power to attract. See, for example, a number of recent and, of course, future pr prospective member states of the Union. And why does it attract? What could it be so? Well, because slowly but steadily people realize that Europe is principled. Of course, it better not be overwhelmed by regulations and by bureaucratic procedures. But it is a normative force. Second, Europe's identity is post-national, really post-national, as we say now, transnational, of course, and does not necessarily signal the emergence of a new geopolitical bloc. Europe's identity is politically and socially acceptable as Europe is now recognized for having achieved relative economic and monetary successes. Societal and political ones are to come. In that respect, the invention of a European citizenship, as they call it now, which is being defined since the tentative introduction of a European constitution or constitution for Europe, is not seen anymore as a sort of intellectual construct, but as a translation of those achievements. And this, in turn, should foster some kind of pride internally of being European, but also some recognition, recognition externally. So if you have the power to attract, <laughs> that's good enough, but you have the power to act on that. Now we come to the crux of the matter. So public diplomacy is increasingly showing, at least to me, its importance because it now illustrates for Europe a power to act. Why? Because, if I'm correct, more and more it helps transcend national interests and policies. Transcend. It builds consensus, which is new. It's a rule of consensus for the first time in the history of Europe, not of majorities. It addresses transnational concerns and issues in a semi, I should say, non-adversarial way. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the rule of the game. Because, therefore, it should encourage for the first time, particularly in a globalized world of ours, open, it should encourage competitiveness instead. Competition is good. And last but not least, because, and this is very vivid these days, at least in the last two or three years, it starts promoting global solution. And I say promoting, not only defining, but saying, okay, these are the issues. And this is why, I, of course, green diplomacy, as they call it today in Europe, and trade diplomacy are really very important because through, there, through those and through the development of those, you start understanding that perhaps, perhaps Europe and its diplomacy is now uh, uh, setting, uh, or defining at least, and perhaps setting international agendas. So let me finish with this. What are the main challenges facing European soft power as best expressed by public diplomacy in what we all call now a post-Westphalian world? But to me, a post-Westphalian is a world where the transnational and the national cohabit, first of all, where borders are indeed erased and nationalism fights back, where national identity is still clinging to national sovereignty. Sovereignly as the last refuge of identity, so to speak. And true, nation states are less prominent and vocal than in the past, but are still very present. So this is the kind of world, of world that it needs to be uh, dealt with. So I think that Europe could fairly easily face the challenges of that world if it succeeds in, and this is why I suggest here, 
in one, speaking with one voice. Because this would be the only way of asserting its identity with some chance of being understood as a force for the good, as I said. Being accepted also as a legitimate democratic power again, and, as I suggested, a credible normative power for the future. And at that point, it will be recognized as capable of proposing solutions to global issues. So I suggested that instead of a conclusion, there is no conclusion in this open debate, I would try to pause a number of things concerning the relationship between this and our transatlantic relations. How could transatlantic relations be affected by <clears throat> the rise of this new power and its expression. I think, collectively speaking, Europe has successfully promoted itself now as a world player, which, of course, intends to remain an ally of the United States. Some people say, would say, where is the choice? Anyway. But is definitely looking to push for new forms of partnership. In other words, what I've been saying or trying to demonstrate could be changing the nature of the relationship at last. Why? Because it would suddenly be an attempt to create a more favorable cooperative environment, enriched by dialogue and not a simple dialogue instead of a cooperation, as the case has often been. And last but not least, is not, when we come to think of it as academics, is not the promotion of European interests by means of a public diplomacy, a way of ushering in collectively this time what some countries like, of course, France and Germany have been pushing forward in their own awkward way sometimes, since 2003 in particular, which is to say, a new form of soft balancing, as it's said today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> of course, I would be very happy to answer your questions, and I hope to hear your comments. <laughs> <laughs> Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus. From Venus. Mm. And American power, as we can see, is in disarray. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for Europe? Does that mean that Europeans will ultimately have to renounce pacifism, stop being Venusians in order to defend Europeanness? What do you see as the likely future of European hard power? Uh, well, it's... American once again, it's a... I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. It, well, once again, it's, it's a question of rebalancing the act of, of relationship, whereby indeed, I mean, there is no soft power without hard power, as you know. But the, the, the balancing act now will be to, um, well, to, to come to this deal by saying, okay, how do we really cooperate in hard power? Uh, okay, we, we absolutely under your umbrella, you entirely in your hands. I mean, whatever we do, and uh, it's just a sort of paper arrangement at the moment. This is to be discussed, because once again, I for one do not believe, once again, in, in the complete disappearance of hard power. When I said, for example, that the renunciation of war was conducive, to installing a soft diplomacy. I, I didn't mean that, and the same could be said of, of Japan, for example, on the other end of the world, you see. I, I, do, I don't mean to say that 
uh, one day uh, we will renounce hard power. It's impossible. So, and considering the situation of Europe vis-a-vis -vis American military power, this has got to be discussed. Not simply by some kind of gesticulation or submission. I'm talking of the two uh, deterrences at the moment in Europe, the French and the British. Um, it has to be negotiated. But it's true that Europe will never be a power again without the resurgence of some Mars attributes. But Mars will be largely Venus. <laughs> no, no, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, I mean, the time has come, particularly, to, uh, to avoid, as Kagan said, you say, this kind of simplification. Because first of all, you say, <laughs> Venus, well, believe me, even now, you say, when he said that, you say, Venus was not Venus at all. No. Nope. So I think this is oversimplification. Professor Knox. <coughs> Something of a follow-up, I think, on Elsa's question. Um, I think you're right to, to stress the internal questions, that, and, and I'd love to ask you for the date on which unity will take over from diversity in Europe. Um, but assuming that that's achieved, how does how does public diplomacy or soft power deal with situations like the Balkans, Rwanda, Darfur? How how is that going to be improved in the future? First of all, as you know, the, this unity within diversity, uh, part of the discourse is, is, is really something that Europeans have to cling to, you say. They don't say that there will be any, uh, 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 that the diversity will be uh, forgotten and in, in, in replaced by unity. It will always have to be, whatever that means, unity within diversity or with diversity. Therefore, uh, the, the national impact of, of policies on European diplomacy is so strong and will remain so strong that it will be f even foolish to envisage a one diplomacy, I mean, one uh, centralized diplomacy with one decider at the top. That's impossible. And because it is impossible, you know, all forms of... Um, all form of transactions there again between the, the national diplomacies have, uh, according to, well, what you might call affinities or alliances, as some people say, uh, the French and the German, the uh, Poles and the Germans, and the British and, and the Germans, I mean, all of us, in other words. Nonetheless, all this has got to, to be part and parcel of the definition of, in the end, having come to a consensus, speaking with one voice. And that's a, different that's a different exercise, but this is the challenge. This is the real challenge. So there again, I don't think unity as such would be the answer, but really a unity which is operational, of course, which is the final product, but also something which will take care and respect of the differences. That's very true. See, and this is why the intercultural dialogue, which is now being uh, uh, conducted, I think, very, uh, very honestly in Europe, has as a, as a perspective to try and form uh, a Europeanness which will be able to act provided that it knows its past and understands what the assets of its future is, particularly in diplomacy. But that sounds, that sounds like a formula for non-intervention. No, I don't think so. I don't think so because <clears throat> that again, what the situation shows today is that, uh, of course, you cannot intervene because in traditional terms, where is the hard power? It's not entirely true. It's more a question of, there again, pooling resources for what, which is important. And you took the example of the Balkans. I don't know if you saw the split differences in the, well, recently in the in self-proclaimed independence of Kosovo, 
well, the split in European nations, you see, with the former diplomacies. Well, obviously, uh, there was nonetheless, there was nonetheless some kind of a European consensus about Kosovo. Let it go, whatever the Russians think or, or whatever, or whatever we think about the reactions of the Russians, etc. But at the same time, you know, we cannot yet impose one view, it's true. So in other words, we cannot intervene. In this case, the best thing was to say, okay, that there was a consensus nonetheless, whatever Spain said because of its separatism or a few others, you say, uh, it had to be done like that. But to, to have a, a European one voice to say, okay, now it's time for Kosovo to be independent, that is not for tomorrow. Hence intervention. Intervention will be difficult. But you know, intervention is not simply sending an army. It, it could be also a, a concurrence of, of sorts of wills and resources, of course, for one specific purpose. I think that pressuring a government could be easily done now without any intervention. You see, the, the, Somalia, I mean, the, the question of Darfur or Darf everything, I think it could be done. It could be done there, it could be done in Africa, it could have been in towards China. Uh, that will not necessarily mean a strong, visible intervention. Uh, let's remember what Moreau said about public diplomacy, it's invisible. But it does not mean it is inexistent. Well, of course. With lack of traditional hard power, you could believe, and it could be invisible but inexistent as well. That is the problem. But nonetheless, you say, things there probably are going to shape. I'm sorry, I don't know your... You say uh, public diplomacy is invisible. Yeah. A diplomacy, if it's carried out by France and as you represented France as a cultural counselor, I gather, here and there, uh, you tried uh, not to work invisibly. You tried to work with some effect to work as a well-schooled bureaucrat, we all were who were in the foreign service, within a budget and with attention to the local environment. This is bilateral, intensely bilateral. And I look as, as I spent my career in public diplomacy, which we didn't call it at the time, but never mind. Um, I look in vain in your description of how Europe is developing, which I recognize and would applaud, for uh, the use of the, the relevant use of the term public diplomacy. I see it in the case of France, a member of the EU. I see it in the case of Great Britain, a member of the EU, and so on as they would be as you were once in Tokyo. You were, I think, yes, there you were, representing France, a member of the EU. But in what you were doing, you fought for France, which was a member of the EU. But, I mean, it's a, a rather, humdrum approach I have based on my experience. Very localized. Um, I must say I've been very fortunate in that because <clears throat> in my times, in other words, in public diplomacy, the European uh, 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 um, perspective of acting together was really shaping in two ways. And when you talk about Tokyo, I do remember our common meetings for common action with all the European members and 
acting in public diplomacy, as we were saying, you say, to say, okay, look, of course, we're all independent. We hold something. We, we all have to do something in this country, and we want to promote our interests. But don't forget that you also have to promote more global interests. And more than, more than you think, perhaps, because, you know, another example. This was the time of, and still is, of the very, um, <clears throat> of the joint German-French actions in the public diplomatic field. Uh, in other words, unable to translate politically, perhaps, uh, uh, this uh, uh, convergence of the interests since, since the early times of the 40s, you say, we were instructed uh, to act jointly and particularly basing ourselves on public diplomacy because that would be a sign even for the other Europeans. I'm talking of external public diplomacy of France and Germany. That we meant that reconciliation, which was the political reconciliation of the 40s, you say, still had an effect and could have an impact also for Europe on the future of our relationship with the rest of the world. I think our views of, it's true that public diplomacy, of course, funded <laughs> by governments and therefore by taxpayers, and therefore you should represent your taxpayers' money. But you know, this, this concept is, has evolved very rapidly, even in my time. I'm, saying I'm talking about the late uh, the 80s and, and early 90s, which is a long time ago already. Uh, but even then, in Europe, there was this, this concern about not acting alone. Of course, that meant that we didn't compete to some extent. But in that respect, in, in, in Europe, you say, we were not really in competition. Not in competition for the language. We all had ours. We were not in competition for, I would say, some values because the values were the same. We were wanted to promote, you know, freedom and, uh, and development as we believed in, our common values. And I remember also talking to, uh, <clears throat> in that respect, <laughs> to uh, people from the USIA, as it was called at the time, in Tokyo. And they said, we had this conversation about what you do, what you do. And they were quite surprised to see that, of course, they were acting alone, so to speak, bilaterally, as you said. And I'm not an optimist there, because already we were no longer acting simply alone in Europe. And there was a big difference. Now, of course, what we were doing could be laughable. So what do you do when you have, at uh, the time was 15, if I remember, uh, member states around the table, and what we do to promote Europe with all our facilities, because there was no European money. But what do we do to promote a Europeanness in Japan? Well, <laughs> it's very difficult to start, particularly when the habits of, of national diplomacies have been so bilateral and and really centered on, on, on you. Because, you know, what attracts the Japanese, say, for example, to France is not what attracts them to Britain or Germany. And therefore, it's more a combination of all that, which was very much put into perspective, than simply promoting our national diplomacies. Yes. I have a question for you about the transatlantic relations between the United States and between Europe. And in light of the fact that this European uni unity is growing considerably, and in light of the fact that if we look at the U.S. dollar compared to the euro, the U.S. seems to be declining in its superpower status. Do you think that in the next, I'm asking you to foresee, which isn't possible, I mean, I'm asking you to like look into the future, which really is impossible, but can you recommend an idea that whether or not the U.S. will end up becoming part of this relationship with Europe in a meaningful way or 
perhaps as Europe increases and the U.S. declines, that they'll end up being very separated and creating kind of two superpowers again in the world. This is what I was suggesting. Uh, thank you for that question because this is, <laughs> this is really transatlantic relations, uh, the, the idea for the future. However, I have to say I slightly disagree on, the, on your premises. I don't think the United States is declining. And this is the view. And I don't see Europe as, as growing apart from the things that I've been saying, which is to say it's organizing itself. I talked about some kind of an organic process, you see, which is the best of processes for growth. Okay. The, the answer to that, and particularly in order to avoid the gap to be widening, in other words, finding ourselves again into blocks and opposed blocks again. As some people, you know, this is, this is one of the uh, things about geopolitics, blocks. Well, this is what I'm trying to say. In transatlantic relations, we have a chance to avoid blocks again. But it's not only... Uh, <laughs> It's not wishful thinking, yeah, because I think it's based on realities. So look at all the things we have in common. And why should we constantly oppose ourselves, as we have done? Of course, we have been in relationship, which has always been unbalanced, and will always be unbalanced, whether you're on one side or the other. You just said, what about the euro today? You believe it's now in the favor of, of Europe. I'm not so sure, by the way, as people say. Nonetheless, all of these should not be seen in terms of opposing ourselves and leading us to a new confrontation, whatever you call the, the entity which results of that. But we have so much in, in common. But this is the case with any, any other part of the world. I mean, we, we're trading in everything. We, we have the same, we should have the same uh, 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 working legislations, for example. We should aim at the same... Uh, uh, societal achievements. So I don't see why, and particularly between Europe and the United States, whatever the past, including the recent past, there is not a possibility to, well, to rebalance the thing and to continue, because it will continue to go in some ways in, in, in different perspectives, different avenues, rather than saying, ah, you see, I told you. Now this one is declining. You are going to take advantage of that. This is, I think, a thing of the past. And if we truly believe in transnational ideas, I think we should indeed think about that. And, you know, once again, the future... I think we you, academics have, have, have a good point when we say, well, look, we might be dreaming about a number of things. We are the liberals and of the modern world. But nonetheless, I think we are also very realistic of what the nature of the exchange should be. And the nature of the exchange is, as I said, well, it's negotiation. You cannot do things without negotiating. What has, in fact, put people aside and put worlds asunder is the lack of negotiation. I might be a little optimistic. But I truly believe in that. Do you, do you see the United States then joining in with the European Union or just having these transatlantic relationships that are more cohesive? That's, that's exactly that. It's, it has to be more cohesive. I mean, uh, there's no need to join or to become part of the European Union. This is what you mean. No, no, it's just acting together. Acting together in a very in a rebalanced, I'm using this word a lot, in a rebalanced way. There's no need of joining. What makes a country European? You mean, well, we, we, what makes the country European? You mean the, the United States European? No. No, what makes a country European? Well, it's... It's the sort of like-mindedness, as they say, with all the people sharing the same values. Well, what else? So are Americans European? 
Well, I think the Americans are Americans, first of all, but I think they are sufficiently like-minded, once again, with the Europeans. I don't know why, the fact of history, that this is even one of the best place, places to start doing what I suggest, which is to say have a real negotiation about our common interest and promotion of our interests. NATO play in the good... balance of hard assault power <laughs> yes. and transatlantic relations? Well, it's, it's probably the interface between uh, Mars and Venus. Eh? <laughs> 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 uh, that's, that's, that's the good question. And if you've been following the latest uh, NATO summit, you say you had all those undertones and the things that I'm saying unity, disunity, I mean, shall we have uh, Ukraine and whatever? No, not too late. Okay. Um, well, NATO is a, is a legacy of the past. You cannot destroy NATO, <laughs> but it has to be reformed. I have to say, I have to say that when NATO for the first time deploy in Afghanistan, which is to say outside Europe. I think it was a very interesting renewal of the idea. All right. So once again, I think a lot of things will come from the dialogue in NATO. There's nothing that we can, we shouldn't avoid that anyway. Because, you know, anything which is European defense, as they call it, or which is uh, American command of all that, is something which has once again to be discussed. What do we want to do with NATO? We have NATO. Very important. It played its role, which is to say it really was the, the shield against any potential uh, aggression in the Cold War, and it worked well. Europe has been at peace since then, whatever the cost for all of us, including, of course, the United States. But it's there, so we should work from that. Don't destroy what works. One more question. Student question. Yeah, um, I was just wondering how the common foreign security policy fits into your, your look at public diplomacy and soft power, because yep. any, the dissent of any one member state makes it so that Europe does not have a unified voice on the world stage. Mm -hmm. That is an intervention force which can go in, but I don't know how much control other member states could have. So it seems like there's disunity in the hard power attempts, and then that undermines soft power attempts, perhaps, or within the. I see the point. It's a, <laughs> once again, it's a central point. Nonetheless, I think the um, um, the joining together of of national facilities towards the a common security and, and acting towards a common security, which people talk about a common defense these days, um, is, is liable to that again, uh, little by little impact on the others, particularly the ones that are not prepared or cannot pull resources into that. As you said, you say when you have a, 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 a union of 27 member states, obviously, the hist because of the histories, and even if they are not simply uh, 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 ex-Soviet Union satellites, uh, others, take Portugal, for example, well, they have something to say, but of course they cannot apparently say it in the same strength of, of voice as some others like Germany would do. This has to be taken into account. And this also is soft diplomacy. It's the soft diplomacy which is really restructuring European power, even the Mars aspect.